So last keynote, but not least, uh, we have uh, Roman from San Francisco coming uh, to talk uh, about a really important topic. Uh, so during the time he, set up, he sets up, I would just add something to Jet Talk. Uh, I'm preparing the keynotes for PLS Paris, right? our main event, which is 10 and 11th of December in three weeks. Uh, 3,000 people talking about APIs. Yeah, the party. Uh, but actually, we have a a VP strategy of an important consulting company who will present how today some big organization, they try to build the Stripe or the Twilio's internally, but they don't have the culture to do that, right? So what they do, they externalize they, some of their teams to, and they invest into startups made by their own employees, building API companies, right? That they will reintegrate later, right? So we'll present that. I, I, don't, I cannot tell more about this. But just to say, sometimes the culture to develop a billion dollar API product is not there in the company yet. So they do that by externalizing it, but having the capital means to be able to reintegrate it later. Really interesting uh, vision. Some big companies are trying to do that uh, right now. But now we have a Roman on stage, uh, and we are five minutes late. So <laughs> let's have a, a warm applause for Roman for his talk. Thank you. Thanks, Mehdi. Good morning, everyone. 2019 marks the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. When NASA wrote the original engineering requirements for the Apollo mission, it didn't even mention the word software anywhere. In his uh, book, Digital Apollo, the uh, MIT aeronautics professor David Mindell wrote, the software is not included in the schedule and it was not included in the budget. But as many of you know, I'm sure in the room, software ended up being pretty critical to the Apollo mission running the ignition sequence, automatic maneuvers, and of course the onboard controls for the spacecraft. In fact, you can find today on GitHub the source code for the Apollo guidance computer. Margaret Hamilton, she joined the program in 1961 to develop software for the Apollo guidance computer. And in 65, she became the team lead and later she coined the term software engineering. By 1968, over 400 uh, people were writing software for the Apollo program. Software was going to help the US get the moon. But what's interesting is there was no existing framework whatsoever of software development philosophy to rely on. It was, it was the very first real software engineering team even, cobbled together from a sprawling army of like MIT personnel, NASA engineers, and even private contractors. And with so many engineers working on this project, NASA and MIT quickly realized that the biggest challenge they would face was organizational. They had to manage communication problems, train new hires, divide unit and integration tests, and they ultimately designed their code base in a series of independent modules so they could actually parallelize the work uh, being done. And a set of central committees would then review each module uh, with, with something called the flight readiness review. And quite frankly, there was a little margin for error when you think of it, because there was real world impact on human lives for every decision the Apollo team was making. Code was prepared for launch in a series of punch cards, and they hardwired uh, into a form of read-only memory called the core rope memory. So as you can see on the screen, they were using ferromagnetic ceramic rings, and if you had to, uh, to do like a one bit, you would basically store, like, uh, store the one bit by threading a wire through the core, and if you wanted to have a zero bit encoded, you would basically get the wire bypassing uh, the ring. So that design was actually resistant to radiation in space, and could store about 1,500 bits per cubic inch. And the software was literally woven into the memory, and the eight big, uh, the, you, ha you had like an eight-week production uh, lead time, meaning that every mistake you would make uh, would essentially throw the whole program off schedule. Sometimes it feels like legacy business uh, software is still running on these like curl rope memories these days. But the Apollo mission is really an incredible snapshot of how hard it is to build software. They had to start quite literally from the ground up and, they, and, and learned all the hard lessons along the way of building infrastructure software with a lofty goal and an extremely compressed timeline. In the decades since, the exponential rise in hardware computing power significantly raised the stakes. These days, like software can suddenly solve like extremely hard problems. But the same questions that the Apollo teams need to answer suddenly became magnified. We've all been relearning the exact same lesson since then. Which brings us to how we deal with this challenge at Stripe. We build economic infrastructure for millions of businesses around the world, and the way we expose our products is via an API platform. And when you operate infrastructure, the decisions you make 
about how you build your software can really impact uh, everyone who relies uh, on your service when they're building their business. So at Stripe, we process like more than 250 million API requests each day. We deploy more than 4,000 API versions a year. And we now maintain roughly like 500 distinct API endpoints. And we do this work with a team of 800 engineers from Dublin to San Francisco to Singapore, so really all around the world. And our API constitutes the building blocks, the common language, and the infrastructure that businesses really rely on every day. The APIs we produce need to be simple and approachable for a very global audience. They need to feel powerful and flexible for developers. But we also uh, want to make sure they're composable collectively so that businesses can really design and evolve their operating model over time uh, through code. And we are really thoughtful about our team structures and design principles so this, that could enable us to, uh, to operate in a distributed fashion, as I mentioned, with engineers everywhere, but also maintaining that autonomy uh, and preserving a consistent API design. And why is it important to get this right? Well, if software is eating the world, APIs are really eating, really eating software. And as we're hearing today on, at API days, like with PSD2, open banking, it doesn't really matter if you're a small startup or a large financial company. Every company is effectively becoming an API company. And so for this talk, I really wanted to focus on a few key principles that we've been uh, learning from that experience at Stripe and hopefully inspire you as you're building and publishing your APIs. So let's dive in. One of the first uh, principles and one of the things that our team has discovered uh, as the most important principle, in fact, is really users first. That lesson is well learned by the best product teams uh, in our industry. Always start with your users. And I learned this myself a while ago, before joining Twitter and then Stripe, I co-founded JollyCloud, a, com a computer company based uh, in Paris, and we were building a modern operating system using web technologies. And the first release was based on our own like, you know, ideas, intuition, and development, but it's only when we started talking to users that we clearly realized what they needed uh, to get to uh, product market fit. Werner Vogels, Amazon CTO and one of the chief architects of AWS, outlined their approach to designing for users in a process called working backwards. And they create four documents, the press release, an FAQ, an outline of the customer experience, and finally a user manual, all that before writing any code. And as the name suggests, it may seem backwards to proceed this way, but really, um, with these resources, Amazon's teams reliably communicate on new projects and they quickly establish a shared vision across the company. And one of the reasons AWS focused here is because when you start building for builders, it's really important to get all of these details right. Uh, developers can spend like more than a dozen hours a day at times designing and debugging using your tools, so it really matters. Donald Knuth, one of the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, legendary author of the term like the art of computer uh, programming and the typesetting system tech that many scientists and mathematicians use today, noted the following, he said, I came to the conclusion that the designer of a new system but must not only be the implementer and the first large scale user, the designer should also write the first user manual. And that separation of any of those four components would have hurt tech significantly. And then he goes on and says, if I had not participated fully in all of these activities, literally hundreds of improvements would never have been made because I would never have thought of them or perceived why they were important. And a similar intense focus is one of uh, Stripe's uh, ethos. It's users first is in fact one of our uh, core company uh, operating principles. It's also a critical part of our history. Back when Stripe was a fledgling startup in a small office in Palo Alto, you know, building out the first version of the API, the team sat with prospective users and carefully interviewed them about the API design. In fact, it took three major redesigns before the API shipped. And for an early stage startup, it sounds like an eternity, but for Stripe, with the focus on developers, we realized it was really critical to get this right and, and make sure we built something that developers felt really good about. Engineers wrote the documentation for every API resource. And in the early days, every API error would actually trigger an email to Patrick and John Collison, our co-founders. And every super ticket would actually page their, uh, their cell phone. So really do things that don't scale, uh, as they say. Um, and they often pair programmed 
the, the first Stripe integrations with the users sitting next to them, sometimes boring their laptop, and Paul Graham referred to this at times as the Collison installation, really like helping users directly and doing things that don't scale at the beginning. To this day, we maintain the same IRC channel, actually, inhabited by some of our earliest users. They provide us key feedback every day on our API, and these passionate users really cement our culture of investing in, in, in great APIs. And today, we need to support a highly diverse global user base in 45 countries, and so we've had to scale this approach to engaging with our users uh, day to day. For example, this year, we designed a new set of APIs that are asynchronous uh, payments APIs to support uh, SCA uh, changes here in Europe. And so we sent the team to London to introduce users to these new APIs and documentation in person and really have first-hand feedback. Running the announcement blog post and the user FAQ before starting the implementation is a very common practice for uh, product briefs at Stripe. That's how we, we try to, to operate as much as possible. And you can see on screen an example describing new support for paper checks in our billing product. And writing that uh, memo really helped us align on, on what we were trying to accomplish with this product. We gather feedback directly from the API documentation and also in the developer dashboard. So we have a CSAT metric there and comments, and all of these are really reviewed every day by our developer experience teams and funneled directly to the product managers and the engineers working on, on, on those products. And in fact, our best products really often emerge from this ongoing conversation with users. After seeing many users, for instance, having this exact pattern of like extract, transform, and load data, we created Sigma. Uh, as a way for users to have a very common SQL interface uh, to uh, query their data and create custom reports. That was basically learning from users directly. We have multiple teams across the company continuously talking and learning from users. We have U UX uh, research teams, product managers, engineers, and developer experience teams. And in fact, no matter which role you have at Stripe, you're really encouraged to talk to users in whatever capacity you operate. And we also maintain an ongoing list of top requests and asks from businesses from all sizes and all regions so we can really know uh, each uh, quarter where the platform needs to evolve. As an infrastructure company, the foundation of our roadmap is really built by seeing those patterns from users across the conversations we have with them. In fact, we just launched the Stripe CLI last week and uh, we've worked with thousands of users in the, in the beta phase to really get it ready and tailor it precisely to their most pressing needs. The next principle is that you have to spend time making uh, the API really good. In San Francisco, we love baking sourdough. Well, being French doesn't look quite like a baguette, but baking bread is a very delicious metaphor for the effort that goes into developer experience, really. The ingredients are always the same. It's like flour, water, salt, and yeast, and your first items will be disastrous. But as any true baker will tell you, over time, you start perfecting the recipe and the technique, and the bread becomes quite special, right? And it's a labor of love, it takes time. You can feed the starter for more than a year and maybe you'll make some mistake and learn from them, adding more water, less salt, and all of that. And quite frankly, API design is like this. Every small decision cumulatively makes the difference. We have teams dedicated to reviewing our developer experience and improving the frontline tool that developers use every day on the platform. Client libraries in multiple languages and API reference both of which we auto-generate from code automatically so they're always accurate. And the, the new CLI tool also I just mentioned are just a few developer touch points that we pay attention to. And it's interesting because externally the Stripe API is often perceived as like very consistent and deeply polished and people often ask me like, what's the secret sauce? Like what's the secret behind your approach? And the truth is there's no secret. I think there's no way around this law of physics in API design, you just have to put in the time and the effort and the care to really make the API delightful. And that means a lot of engineers who understand the, users, the user needs firsthand are involved at every single stage of that development life cycle for the API. And so it's really important to infuse a culture of great API design at multiple levels of your uh, organization. So how do you do that? Well, over time we've settled on a few key properties that capture our approach for this. Uh, for this, uh, for, for this. The first one is simplicity. Very top level API resources should be very easy to understand. You should use common names and you should map to real life concepts in a way that feels intuitive. You can see on screen customers, for instance, that should you know, represent exactly what it is, a customer for your business. And it makes that feel tactile for the developer and makes it easier to understand. Next, API should also be composable. They should be additive. 
building blocks should really fit nicely together. And our goal is that any component of the Stripe API should really work predictably with any other components. And wherever there's a point of friction, we work hard to really smooth it out. And as you use more of Stripe's APIs, like, you gain a cumulative advantage. In fact, our users say, for instance, when they start building a marketplace using our Connect API, oftentimes they steadily add billing and then terminal if they want to have like in-person payments as well. And so the business evolves and we seek to unlock this new functionality with the, the, this composable a API design. Next is predictable. APIs are really as you know, infrastructure. And when you turn on the, the tap, you expect water to come out. When you check your Swiss watch, you expect uh, that watch to tell the exact right time. Well, when you perform an API operation multiple times and under this, you know, multiple conditions, you should expect the same outcome. And so we provide, for instance, idempotent operations on the API, so that means that you can safely rerun transactions on the API multiple times without worrying about charging your customers um, and having duplicating charges on the API. And each of these design principles enable businesses on Stripe to reliably integrate with any number of APIs, operate them at scale, and maintain that over time with a minimum amount of effort. And finally, APIs should be backwards compatible by design. You should continue transacting on Stripe even without ex your, uh, you know, changing your existing integration. It should just continue to work as expected even as we change the API and even as we add new features. You can choose to upgrade whenever you're ready uh, on your infrastructure. So these are just a few principles, and we have a rigorous, rigorous API design process that allow any team to follow them while independently designing their new products or their new features. And here is kind of the, an overview of the process we follow uh, when we build APIs. First, we start with a design document that proposes a new API specification. It can be a new endpoint, it can be changes to parameters or response types, or maybe a webhook behavior that's different. We then have a cross-functional review team with expertise on platform operations, developer experience, front-end tooling, security, and other areas across the company. And that group meets in person to discuss the change uh, in detail. And they will ask questions like, are the changes consistent with the rest of the API? Will the experience feel consistent uh, when you're using this particular programming language or this particular client library? How will this look and feel for users outside of the organization? Will that break their expectations in some ways? How might the change affect any kind of product or feature on top of, uh, of those uh, APIs that we are changing? How is the friction going to be for an existing user, for a new user? H are we introducing technical burden for ourselves in the future like, or, or for users? All of these questions are what we discuss in depth before we, be, before we change the API publicly. Then we conduct user testing to learn about how real users uh, might adopt the new feature and what tensions might come up along the way. And we then produce an early version and use infrastructure in our system to get in specific users and uh, get as much early feedback as possible on a real working API that we have not yet shipped to the entire world, right? And as we iron out any bugs, document those new features, we issue a new API version. And when we are ready to go live, we start uh, rolling out incrementally that feature to users across the platform, and we keep, a, we keep a close eye for issues that might come up along the way. And the key to this process is that we really want to have um, many opportunities for feedback as early as possible and uh, during the entire life cycle of designing the API. We really don't want to build products in isolation from our users. One of the most important opportunities for expert feedback is that, uh, in, in that flow is our Stripe API review. And this team of engineers encourages a culture of great API design, and over the years, they've arrived at a set of encouraged design patterns for the actual API. I'm going to share just a few quickly um, that, uh, that we have from our kind of ongoing checklist and, and guidelines we use internally. Here is a good one, for instance. Avoid industry jargon. Our users should not be expert in payments. Stripe should provide something extremely familiar and tactile for parameter names. So, for instance, every credit card has a long number on, on the front of the card, and that's known in the industry as the primary account number of PAN. But we say card.number, we don't say card.pan because we don't want, like, you know, only insiders know PAN, but we want all users across the platform to really understand quickly what we mean, so we use card.number. Some of these examples can get more detailed. For instance, we use nested structures to group related concepts in the API rather than like flattening everything 
uh, at the top level. That kind of improves understanding, but also enables future extensibility for the API. Properties in the API are preferred as enums rather than booleans for us, and we can't predict all the future state for a property. So in this case, you have the example from issuing our API to create and manage physical and virtual cards. If we had chosen to make cancel the boolean to, to denote the active and cancel state of a card, well, we couldn't have had it the inactive state that we later realized we needed. Um, so that's why enums are preferred in the API. If any request on the API affects an object state, it should be reflected in the response. You have an, ob an example here on the screen. I'm uh, sending a request to modify a customer's description, passing the string hello. Well, in this case, it's really important that hello is also reflected in the response, so you know your API request was successful and did exactly what you expected. We have a consistent pattern for polymorphic APIs, and sometimes APIs can return multiple types of objects and you still want to have like one generalized API endpoint. We can include a polymorphic response for each time, and we know that polymorphism in APIs is quite difficult to get right. And so the best pattern we've come up with is to rely on a type field to e easily disambiguate what object we're talking about, and then provide parameters unique to that type of field is a, in a ne designated uh, nested structure. So for the developer glancing at the JSON, it's quite easy to understand what's happening. Side effects and meaningful changes should also be expressed through verbs on the API. And so when you substantially modify a core API resource, we use explicit verbs uh, to make it much easier to understand uh, that there's a state transition. So in this case, we capture a payment intent or we mark an invoice as uncollectible. This also gives us a neat and understandable pattern for, for time and timestamps when you have any of those changes taking place. So any such timestamps, we refer to them as verbed underscore at. And finally, API review explicitly encouraged providing early access to uh, rapidly iterate on designs with beta users. And, and a critical part on, on our side for our infrastructure is a system of, uh, of, of gates that we unlock, um, that we use to unlock new functionality for, for uh, users on the platform. And so what that means is that we can invite external users to try a feature before it's released. And uh, in fact, we can use that to trial a few uh, designs uh, on the API until we settle on, uh, on the right one. The issuing uh, API I mentioned was actually developed for longer than a year behind a gate, and uh, we uh, GA'd uh, the, the product recently in the US. It's also important to remove those gates aggressively over time, by the way, because you don't want to maintain multiple code paths over time, especially when the feature has finally shipped uh, to, uh, to your global audience. So, these all may seem like small details, but in aggregate, they really start to be impactful and they really add up. And of course, none of these are hard and you know, fast rules. That's exactly why we conduct those in-person API uh, review discussions to really go uh, in depth and sometimes make exceptions. But the API uh, review team really uh, want to make sure that the, uh, the developer experience is what drives us. Never uh, how easy it's gonna be for Stripe, but really how easy it's gonna be for developers using our APIs. And we don't always pick the right design the first time around. We ultimately always learn from users. For example, we introduced an API about a year ago called Issuer Fraud, Fraud Records, and we were quite excited about this API, but quite frankly, uh, some users were confused about it, and when you were Googling Issuer Fraud Records, that would be like the only results on Google would actually be the Stripe documentation, so probably not a great sign. And so early feedback from that small set of users was really critical, and over time, we brainstormed new options and we renamed this to Early Fraud Warning uh, API, and I think that uh, really closely captured the essence of what we're trying to accomplish with that API. And that's just one example on, on, of why um, you know, de, you know, naming is hard and API design is quite hard, especially with naming. Every Stripe API resource should have an easy to understand name, and that's why we use things like customers, payment methods, disputes, and we're obsessive about naming, because it's not that they need to make sense, it's also that we know that users will have to type them over and over again. And as they do so, it really acts at a touch point with Stripe. And names have a really long life uh, in general. You can go back and look at the basic like Unix commands that we still use every day uh, on macOS or Linux. Uh, they have like these arcane names like RM, MV, and CP, and why are they so cryptic, you might wonder. 
Well, one of the original Unix uh, pioneers, Hendrik Thomasson, explained that in the days of the Unix mainframes, you would log into a thin client and you would be charged for CPU and network time. And the characters were uh, used at a premium. And he also said that the keys really required a hard hit every time. And so you're really, uh, if you're working like a whole day, you would really feel it in your hands. And so that's the reason why Unix commands repertoire has those very short names. And if you can save one typing keystroke per command, that really helps. Uh, that's what Thomas said. And so we're still using those same Unix commands today. And so that's why we take naming very seriously. We, we expect the names we choose uh, to live in software systems for quite a long time. We also spend a lot of time building with our own APIs to experience any pain points firsthand ourselves. And when I talk to interview candidates, one of the questions I'm curious to, to uh, to answer about their current role is what are you building? And it's quite surprising at times that engineers can be quite divorced from the, the product uh, they build for their users. Microsoft manager uh, Paul uh, Maritz coined the term dog fooding. And um, that's inspired by Alpo uh, Dog Food, um, who said that the product was so good that um, the spokesperson said their, their dog would eat Alpo every day. And so Maritz insisted in the fact that all employees should dock food and use the Microsoft Land Manager back then to understand how the product could be better. And that's also what we do at Stripe. We regularly dock food our APIs and developer tools. We build uh, practical examples ourselves. I've personally built several kind of sample businesses on Stripe to, uh, to understand how the API works and how we can make them better. We also produce focus reviews um, for, uh, for APIs and we uh, focus on those friction logs for developer experiences, things that you would not typically find in a bug uh, report. Uh, for instance, I found this part of the documentation really confusing or maybe like that was like too many steps, I got distracted along the way. You really identify the sharp edges that you can smooth out uh, for users and that's typically not captured in a bug report. Many employees at Stripe also run a side project or a family business. These are just a few examples uh, on screen and that really helps us have more first-hand experience of what it means to run a business on Stripe. Uh, one of our engineers here, Johnny, manages Cushion to help uh, freelancers. We have our uh, CRO uh, also on screen, Barry Paget, also running a, a horse farm on Stripe using billing for invoices and even our CTO, David Singleton here, created hotdogpins.com uh, to sell custom pins like his favorite, like here, a skin hot dog. So all of that built on Stripe. And that brings us to our final principle, design your organization. When we look back to the Apollo mission, one of the properties they discovered was the importance of really setting a clear vision and direction for organizational structures. And one of the mythic stories from that era is when JFK um, made his first visit to the NASA HQ in 1961. And as the story goes, he noticed a janitor uh, carrying a broom and uh, he interrupted his two, walked over to the man and asked, uh, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? And uh, the janitor responded, well, Mr. President, I'm helping put a man on the moon. <laughs> However, it was significantly harder to establish shared vision across a sprawling army of NASA personnel, MIT scientists and engineers, and so they designed new organizational structures. And in the final report of the IPOLO Guidance Software Task Force, NASA said the difficulties in software development will continue to require top-level management attention. Software complexity requires a high level of communication and participation by the many organizations involved. And so in that process, NASA uncovered what is now well known as an emergent property of software engineering. In 1967, computer scientist Mel Conway authored what has now become known as the Conway, Conway's Law, summarizing the same lesson that NASA had learned. Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. So said differently, uh, you can have the, this visual and kind of think about how, what that means for software in particular. As we've steadily replaced the physical world with software systems, we can learn a lot about how a software works in a certain way by looking and examining the organization that actually created it. And as a basic example, if five teams work on a product and a software system, chances are there will be five separate components. And Conway's law has an inverse corollary, cor corollary, sorry. That means that you can be very intentional about how you design your teams and how you design your organization in general. 
knowing that this work will you know, uh, be reflected in, in the products we, you, you produce. And so when you look at the map of our product at Stripe, you can observe something else. Like, spoiler alert, this is actually mapping to our org charts. We have payments infrastructure and foundation groups at, at the bottom, and they're building what we call this global payments and treasury network. And on top, you have multiple products group for everything that runs on top of that stack. Stripe is a very global engineering organization, and because of that scale, it's important for us to build cultural and communication systems that support quickly building new APIs. And so the, the, the constellation of API design principle that, that I mentioned earlier really enable us to support millions of internet businesses of all shapes and sizes. And every company is unique, but if you really work and think about how you organize, organize, organize your, uh, your company, how you communicate between teams, you can actually build great software. So these are just the lessons we've learned, um, and, and they don't just apply, I think, to API platform. I think they just apply to every engineering team that can study you know, their practices to better understand how to build their product. And these are just a few things that you can try with your team. First, build for your users today, but consider your users of tomorrow. Interview your users carefully. Uh, think about the patterns of design as your North Star, but remember that every new feature you add, you're probably going to have to maintain for a long time. Next, build for builders. The APIs are the building blocks that creators can use, and you want them to be predictable as they design their solutions. You can't always predict how your API will be used, but what you can be sure about is that your most novel products on top of your platform will most likely come from enabling that creativity. And finally, design your organization and communication structures to support your product. You can really influence your, the quality of your product by designing your organization and how uh, it communicates across teams. So these are lessons we've learned along the way. And uh, catch me after this talk if you'd like to discuss more. Thank you very much. So to not cut the break of everybody, so Roman will be available for questions uh, directly now. Uh, just to say, Stripe worth 22 billion uh, for 2,000 employees, right? Something like that, 2,000? Yeah. 2,000 employees, yeah. Yeah, so that's 11 million dollar per employee. So thank again the 11 million dollar speaker. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. It's coffee time. We go back at 11. But if you have any questions to Roman, you can uh, you can ask them now. Thank you.